Oh, I can just pick it up off my, my mic. That'll work. Um, my name is Rob Hirschfeld. I'm a member of the uh, uh, community member of the OpenStack Foundation. Uh, I'm also the chair, the co-chair of the operations track. Uh, and I gave myself the first slot, thinking it would be an easy session with not many people in it. Um, and so uh, we'll, we'll kick things off. We've, we've got a great set of uh, talks and, and speakers and panels. Uh, we had so many people submit talks that uh, we actually opened up an extra track. So tomorrow there's two tracks uh, for the, the Operations Summit part. Uh, and then there's an interoperability panel that came up uh, in the strategy session that I'm, I'm chairing. So there's really exciting things going on. If you care about operating OpenStack, which I do very much, then um, we've got a great lineup of, of talks, speakers, and panels. Um, we even had so many people, we pulled a couple of, of speakers into their own panel just on DevOps and continuous deploy. So, all right, I still have two minutes, three minutes for this? So here's the refrain. Uh, yeah, I, I want to play the song. Do we have the audio? I'm looking for a drum up. This is You're going to have to forgive the, the language. I didn't get the radio edit. <laughs> but you don't have to say the F word. You can just say OpenStack, because that's the, how it goes, all right? So I love crowd experiments. All right. This is uh, here's the here's the chorus for the song. It's called Thrift Shop. I'm gonna pop some tags. Only got twenty dollars in my pocket. I'm, I'm hunting, looking for a come up. This is fucking awesome. Nah. All right. So the 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 redrafted words are: I'm gonna write some code. Okay. Got <laughs> five hundred fifty coders on my project. I'm a hunting, looking for a cloud up. This is OpenStack, awesome. All right, and even if you don't want the other the other three lines, please help me nail that. This is OpenStack, awesome. All right, can we do it? Yeah, maybe. All right. I got one guy in the back. I know him. Fifty dollars for you, Judd. Later. All right. I can. Good suggestion. Thank you. Not that one. Oh, the whole thing's fun. Yeah, you'll see me running around. Like, I'm not busy enough. You'll see me running around uh, catching some video. And I've already got some contributors on this. All right, can you see it? I'm going to write some code. Only got five. I've got, let me fix it because I changed it. Once I knew the number was 550. Shoot. Five fifty coders on my project. I'm on my hunting, looking for a code up. This is OpenStack. Awesome. Ready? You guys ready? No. I can tell you're not, but we're going to do it anyway because I've only got three minutes. You didn't know you were going to be part of a crowd experiment, did you? So it happens when you show up early. All right, uh, I bet I can get this. I'll sing along. You guys ready? One, two, three. I'm going to write some code. 550 coders on my project. I'm, I'm a hunting, looking for a cloud up. This is awesome. All right, one more take, and then I'm going to actually talk about what I'm supposed to talk about. One, two, three. I'm going to write some code. Got 550 coders on my project. All right. Whew. Welcome to OpenStack Anonymous. My name is Rob. Let me, let, me, let me actually find the presentation. Whew. And it's still not, we're, we're still not that much time. But since the room is standing, can people in the back come forward a little bit? We've got a line waiting outside, and I'm going to start. Oops, and that's not where we're starting. <laughs> All right. Uh, how many people went to this talk when Greg Althaus did it at Folsom the, at the last summit? Not that many. Okay. 
Um, so the, the topic for today, I've already done my introduction, but I'll do it again for the video because I'm assuming we'll start here. Hello, welcome to the OpenStack Summit. My name is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, I'm an OpenStack board member uh, and the co-chair of the operations track. I also work for Dell. Uh, and I'm one of the founders of the Crowbar Project, which since the very first days at OpenStack has been focused on creating an open, deployable reference platform for OpenStack. And you'll see why this is important and what we're trying to accomplish with that uh, in, in this. Uh, I'm also a, a big evangelist for DevOps and, and what we're trying to accomplish with DevOps. And one of the things that, that has been really important for me uh, and my team has been to be able to help people bootstrap into DevOps. Uh, the, the docs work is great, but if you're going to create a sustainable cloud, you're not going to install and maintain OpenStack from documentation. You're going you're to want to do it from automation. And because of our early investment with this, uh, OpenStack, uh, I, I wish I had real statistics on this, but, but I believe very strongly OpenStack is the most deployable of the open source clouds uh, in that We've really spent a lot of time building operations uh, and doing it very openly. So the sad thing about this talk is that I could have given the same, same presentation from the last, last topic. Um, and what I, what I have in here is links. I should have done a bit.ly tag, and I'll, I'll, I'll tweet that. Uh, but I, I really suggest that you go and look at, at what Greg Althaus talked about for Folsom and, and he spent 40 minutes. I have these slides, and I'm going to blow through them fast because uh, Greg is smarter than me and did a better job on those slides. So what, what I suggest you do, though, is, is participate in the discussions about reference architecture. Uh, this session, this topic, is about upgrade. Upgrade is as much about interoperability and reference architectures as it, as it is about upgrade patterns. And the reason is this. If we want to accomplish an upgradable solution, if we want OpenStack to upgrade, then we must have a way that people can know that they're breaking other people's upgrades. We must have a way for people to compare operations. All these things are tightly coupled. And so while I'm going to try and focus on upgrades specifically, you cannot do upgrade to the exclusion of reference architectures or interoperability or testing or any of those things. Um, and the other thing I'm going to suggest you do uh, is to look through some of the OpenStack upgrade projects. Um, there's upgrading with minimal downtime. There's a wiki page for here. There's a project called Grenade, uh, which, the, which Piston has been uh, promoting and has been part of the DevStack process. Um, and it's, it's an interesting project. It, it doesn't accomplish, to me, what we really need, which is multi-node distributed upgrades. And I want to start with that. This talk is not about upgrading a database or upgrading a dev stack or upgrading, you know, it's, it's not about that. It's about taking a production deployment and making it work release to release, milestone to milestone, preferably milestone to milestone, and I'll talk about that. Uh, so this is actually the, the table of contents for Greg's slide. Uh, and we've got a lot of, you know, the thing about OpenStack, it's got a lot of change in it. Uh, we have this very fast cycle. We have miners that effectively come out uh, as a, as a, every three months, so you're going to take Grizzly. A lot of people are going to wait three months and take the, the, the next, the patch version of Grizzly, um, although we're seeing a trend of people just switching to Havana and staying on Havana trunk, which I'm very excited about. Um, so what we expect is that operators are going to want to keep their clouds running. Right. You're going to get this in production. We're going to give you a six-month release cycle faster, potentially, if you're taking the intermediate uh, patches and changes. And we, want, and, and we want to keep it so that you're always in production. Right. Public clouds are doing this. It is, it is doable. It's not easy, but it's doable. And the reason why we want to do this is fundamentally, if you want cloud interoperability, you don't want to be lagging behind. Right. If you've deployed Essex, and you're planning to stay on Essex for two years, that might be great for you. What you're going to lose is the ability to take that workload and move it to Rackspace, right, or HP, or uh, DreamHost, or one of the, the hosters who are deploying Grizzly, right? Because there's enough incompatibilities here that you're going to have problems. We're working to address that, but you can't plan to stay at Essex for two years and, and still get interoperability. You could stay there if you have an isolated cloud. 
All right, enough interoperability. Um, this is an eye chart, and so I'm not going to try and read it, but there's a whole bunch of questions about this, um, about what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish, um, what types of changes that we're making, and how our paradigms are. And I'm going to breeze through this because this content is something Greg went through six months ago, and it's, um, it's enough for you. If you, if you want to go back and see some of the basics on this, then we'll do that. Um, basically, what Greg boiled down to was there's three ways that we can solve this, this problem. Okay? Uh, we can just keep patching code, right? Doing things on the fly, um, and and there's uh, this, this is this is the continuous deployment model, uh, and there's a lot of good reasons to to want to do this. Um, split, migrate, and replace. This is this is the model that we're going to end up more focused on, where what we're doing is we're actually allowing the code to operate at different you know at different compatibility points and still operate gracefully. Uh, and then there's the rolling upgrade solution uh, where we do actually in this, and now, so now we're getting into three flavors of how we're going to do this. So the rolling upgrade approach says that I can um, take the split and replace, but actually do it even more incrementally. So where I might have had to phase in all of my controllers at the same time, I actually want to be able to say this piece is on this version, this piece is on that version, and then go, go through my deployments in waves. So those are, those are important. Uh, and the challenge, but the challenge of doing this is that it requires you to have a level of automation and orchestration that most people have not made the investments in. Okay, I know this, I work for Dell, I talk to a lot of customers, a lot of people are interested in DevOps, a lot of people are starting DevOps, right? Actually, I'll, I'll do a show of hands. How many people in this room have an operative DevOps environment? Okay, it's a little bit, keep your hands up for a second. How many of you are using it for continuous deployment? Okay, so we we went from about a third of the room down to about a tenth, maybe a little bit less. So what I, what I can tell you because I, I talked to the customers, the ones who are seeing the highest ROI, um, they've made the investment in, in these DevOps DevOps processes because the rate of change on these projects is very fast. And and let's talk. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but what we've, what we've been doing and what you'll see in the OpenStack community for operators, and this is why I love chairing this track, is that we as a community are collaborating on how to operate. So if you're not in on DevOps, if you're not using tools and automation to help you manage your deployments, you don't have to go and start from scratch. There's significant starts that you can take advantage of to see how it's done and get, get rolling and get working, which is what I highly recommend because then, you're going to benefit from other people's experience, and you're going to be able to make changes and fixes and things like that and contribute to the conversation. And I'll, I'll stop for a second and explain how that would work. So if you go and deploy OpenStack and just do it however you think is best or what you've read in the manuals, right? That, that's great. You should do that. What you're not going to be able to do is if you, if you have a bug or something like that, and you're, trying to rep, and you're looking for somebody on the list to help replicate that bug, they're going to fall back to DevStack. Okay. DevStack's great. You must use DevStack if you want to contribute code and if you want to be part of the, the active community. But if you're just trying to find out if this bug is related to your configuration, which it quite likely is, or code, which it could be, right, or random gravitational effects of Saturn, all those things are, are reasonable things. What you want to be able to do is you want to be able to go to the list and say, hey, I have this problem, and they're going to say, well, what did you do to set it up? And if you can point to a cookbook or a module or a script that sets up your system that other people are using, there's a chance somebody can give you help. Right? That is what this project is about. Okay? That one phrase, that somebody can give you help. And we want that to work in operations, too. So what's new in my presentation? Uh, I'll, I'll say one statement we, we did. Um, our team made the decision to skip over Folsom because we wanted to go to Grizzly, which is contraindicated to a lot of the other things I'm talking about. Because we felt that uh, since we didn't have upgrade, we didn't want to put more customers in the field on Folsom. We wanted to focus on getting Grizzly. And so for us, we're already getting, we already have Grizzly deployments in our, our QA phases, right? 
We felt like that was a better investment than waiting three months and doing, and doing Grizzly afterwards. We have got to get out of this cycle. Okay? That does not mean that we're going to keep skipping releases. What it means is we're going to use continuous deployment technologies and pull from source and being on trunk and work deployments on trunk and work deployments with our, our developers in the community because that's how we get out of having to chase the, the wheel on these releases, right? And this is really important. So what we decided was rather than go big release to big release is that we had to invest in technologies. We're using a pull from source technology that actually brings source code in from Git so we don't have to wait for packagers. Right? If we find a bug, we could actually test the fix before we go to Garrett. It's really helpful. So in these cases, what we've, what we've been able to do is uh, sort of accelerate our ability to do continuous deployment. I wish I could tell you I also had upgrade in this, and we're going to talk about why, why we don't have it. Um, the other thing that you'll see, and this is one of the challenges, uh, OpenStack has been getting more complex. There's just, right, we have more projects, we have more components, we have more interdependencies between components. It's a good thing because it means that the power of the system is, is getting there. It's a good thing because it allows people to contribute in a, in a narrower scope without breaking things as much, right? Those are all positive effects. What we see on the other side, though, is from an operator's perspective, from a deployer's perspective, I now have a lot more projects. I've got a lot more moving parts, I've got more pieces. It's okay. But we just we need to be aware that it's increasing the need for automation. It's increasing. It's definitely increasing the need for upgrade. I'll give you an example. <laughs> Let's say I want to upgrade the Nova controller in my environment. And this is just an example because if I if I was to take this for every component in the system, you'd have a similar map. And I think I, I kept adding to this slide, and it was I, I had to stop because the arrows got too confusing. Just Nova, right? So to upgrade Nova, I have to make changes to the database. Message bus, I have to make sure those are at the right versions for me, right? Those are prereqs. Oslo, Keystone, and Glance are all going to feed into my Nova deployment, and there's going to be some circular dependencies. I'm going to have to then, once I've got that upgraded, I'm going to have to then be, make sure that my, compu my, control, my compute nodes can handle the new version that I just put on the controller. And Salomner can t deal with the data that Cinder is actually connected into it, and Quantum is connected in into it. And each one of those has their own graph just like this. Right? This is the challenge that we've got. This is, and th I'll actually tell you, I have this problem on install, let alone upgrade. So I, I don't want to scare anybody. Right? The, the power of these components, this is not that, a, this is actually perfectly typical of any enterprise application. Right? I, don't, I don't think of OpenStack as any different than an enterprise application as dependencies and, and, and interconnectedness. Uh, but we have to deal with that. And so this is, this is the thing, and one of the things that people need to take away from this track, not just this session, but it is our responsibility as operators, right? It's my team's responsibility as somebody who's helping package operations uh, scripting to keep forward pressure on the developers to quickly catch things that break version-to-version -version compatibility, okay? to quickly catch things that aren't upgradable, to quickly catch things where we change something that creates a problem for deployment. Right? What we want to be able to do is if something makes it through Garrett and, and causes a problem for deployment, I want to be able to talk to that developer that day right? or that the next day as a, as, a, as a minimum. That's what we're shooting for. Because if I can do that, then we can actually make a significant difference in how our releases churn. Right? If I'm waiting until there's a release candidate before I'm doing deployment, I, I've already lost the devs. They've already, frankly, they've already moved on, and they should have moved on to the next release at release candidate phase. They're they're going to be in bug fix mode, and we're going to they're going to be a lot of them are working on the next stuff. Um, so this is this is the simple math on this. It, it's impossible to forward predict what you want on your APIs, right? I, I, I can't easily see into the future. Times when we've tried to do that have been problematic. It's, hard, it's, it's pretty hard for me to do. This is what is, would be called N minus 1 to make sure that when I write a new component that it is able to go backwards to the old versions, right? We need to do that. It's really important. It's not something that a, de a developer normally sets up in their environment. Right? It's something that you have to build tests for, something you actually have to work through 
Uh, Grenade is partly doing this. Um, and I, I, this is one of the things that we're trying to take on in a much more significant spot. And to me, the only answer is test. You, you have to validate that the new version of a component is going to work with the, other, with the, up, the last version infrastructure dependencies. Okay. And you have to want that to happen because you have to re understand its value and upgrade. The alternative, and I, I, I'm glossing over the alternatives because I just don't think they're acceptable. And I have a slide about this. Um, the alternative is to shut the whole system down, upgrade everything at once, and then bring the whole system back up, right? The Big Bang Theory. And I'll, I actually have a really nice graphic for that. Um, and, and the challenge is the reason why we do that so much is because it's easy. I can test all of the components as a system, as a system, all with this, this, current, this current checkout, this current commit, and know it works, right? It's much harder to start doing these other, these other intermediate components. If we can do it, this n minus one compatibility, what happens is that then we can start stepping through our code changes. And I have going from Havana, uh, Grizzly to Havana in this slide, but what um, I'd actually like to see us be able to do is make sure that milestone to milestone is checked out, right? Um, and there's, there's some important reasons to do that. Um, but as a minimum, uh, but uh, that's, that's actually the minimum. We, we also want to be able to go Grizzly to Havana and then Havana to I. So what we're going to do is, first you have to upgrade this core component. It has to be able to deal with the old and the new. Then we have to upgrade the Grizzly piece. You know, then you can start upgrading the, pe the pieces in the field and get them to the next version. It's called N minus one because you don't try to do this for the whole system. There's, and this is, this is the trick, there's an expectation and we're building tooling to help make this expectation real, but everybody here has to participate. There's an expectation that you will stay current, right? What we're trying to do is make it easy and effective for you to stay on the current versions, for you not to stick at Essex, right? Which there's significant, I, the user, I think I'm conflicting with it, but there's a, a Stefan is doing a presentation about the user, uh, the, that's not, it's Tim Bell who's doing a presentation. I highly recommend you look at his Prezo, it's because it's awesome. Uh, about who's using what and what they're doing, and it breaks down users and operators. It's a really a fascinating report about how much adoption and how diverse the use of, uh, of OpenStack is. Uh, but what he'll show you is that 25% of the user base is on Essex, about 50% is on Folsom, and about 25% uh, is on Grizzly. No, Grizzly's still out, right? So they're just come out. So what we're, what we're seeing is a much faster trend towards adoption, and the reason why we're investing so heavily in ops and DevOps is because it's part of the contract, sort of, so to speak, for operators to stay on the current versions and then for us to make it easier for people to do that. Okay. And so ideally, you would have this same capability to step through your migrations from either the client or the server side. And I, I wish I could tell you that that was something that was guaranteed in, in the code today. It's not. Uh, this is why my start, I, I don't feel like we're making as much progress as I want. So in some ways, our job, right, uh, my team's job, a lot of people in the room I know because I know a lot of you, uh, your jobs are to keep pressure on the developers and test these things and make sure they're going through. If it's not tested and we're not pushing back on that, it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, so small, st small steps versus big. Uh, it's much easier to catch a change in a small step. It's much easier to debug in a small step. And so a lot of what we're trying to do and a lot of the reasons you'll see continuous deployment as such an important topic is these small steps reduce risk. These small steps are much easier to catch the individual commits that made a breaking change. They're much easier for us to handle. Um, but they take, there's more of an upfront investment in making this happen. So one of the things that, that we're trying to do is we want to make it possible and safe for people to take these intermediate updates rather than waiting for a big, a big jump, right? Because just going from Folsom to, have, to have, uh, Grizzly is going to require a fair number of changes. But if, you could, if we do it incrementally and we can get people through those changes, then it becomes much safer. It becomes much easier to make those changes and keep up to date. Um, the, the, the trick here is that the more people we have doing continuous deployment, the easier this becomes. because then it, the burden doesn't fall on one person, 
right, or one company or one deployment, right? One person takes this build, they find an issue, and, and it can get fixed, and everybody else can learn from it. And what happens is if a lot of people are doing that, then individually, you might find one thing, but you're going to benefit from 10 other people who've had their one thing happen and not repeat the same mistakes. Okay. Uh, and I could spend and do spend uh, days actually war working through how those things are going get, to get through. The migration cube. I, I have a tendency to visualize um, big problems in, in these three-dimensional graphs. Somebody, uh, somebody correctly pointed out that there's more than three dimensions in this chart. Uh, and it would be a tesseract, but uh, let, me, let me explain what this is, and, and hopefully, if nothing else, uh, you can find a way to boil this down and give it to your executives and explain why you want to invest in, in deployment technologies and, and uh, in paying ahead instead of behind on the deployment curves. What, what the axes here are small steps versus large steps, uh, server versus client, and safe versus destructive. So uh, destructive, destructive really is an a indication of risk. But if you have to move all of the VMs off of a compute node in order to upgrade that compute node, that is not a safe upgrade. Okay? If you can just deploy in place and all the VMs stay in place, that's safe. Okay? Um, and if you think about it, the, the, amount, of, the amount of work to, move, to, to drain and move off of a VM, it requires a lot more infrastructure, capabilities, technologies, it's a much more complex thing. Sometimes we've got to do it. But if we can work on smaller incremental steps that don't require that, rock on. That, that, that helps us. Wow, and I'm talking fast, so I'm going to have time for discussion. What time does this session end? I'll just go all day. Ten thirty. All right. Wow. Awesome. So the idea here is at the bottom of this corner, we have continuous deployment, right? So in that case, uh, what you'll see happening, what what is is going on with the the major cloud vendors, and this isn't just OpenStack. Um, I have the privilege through my position at Dell to talk to hyperscale deployments, uh, talk to customers who are running a wide variety of things, and when you get to a certain size you roll things out continuously, right? Uh, we've had some great people in the Amazon cloud really help to find this pattern um, and, and work, work out what's going on. Um, uh, Netflix specifically has been releasing something called uh, Chaos Monkeys. Hopefully you guys have heard about that. If you haven't, look it up. They intentionally inject failures and performance degradations into their environment to make sure it's operating and that, they can, that their, their overall infrastructure handles it. Um, which is a way of making sure that things are safe, right? Um, but the idea here is for continuous deployment is that we're going to take uh, an individual commit and start deploying that across our, our environment, okay? Some people would do it a day's worth of code, um, but you'd actually start rolling that change out within your environment. And the idea is, is that your system is with a compatibility level, if you change something on this side, the other versions are compatible for it. You've got to test to make that work. Um, if we go to the back side of this, we're talking about more destructive changes. So a big rolling upgrade, uh, if somebody changes your client, uh, like Flash seems to like to do every once in a while, and all of a sudden your site doesn't work because Flash isn't working, that's, that's a forced client migration. Right? Um, parallel operation would mean I'd actually run two systems side by side. We see customers doing this. Um, They've got an Essex proof of concept running, and they, they jump over to running. This is, or actually, the people do this normally. They run their dev, they run a test, they run a POC, they move things into production. Um, often they do them on completely separate systems, which creates some redundancy, but that's one of the ways that you deal with, with this type of thing. And then, of course, Big Bang, I already described, where you just shut everything down, upgrade it all at once. You take a service window, and then you pray that it comes all back online. Um, yeah. The, one of the things that's interesting about this is that, you know, and I didn't, I don't think I threw this in here. How many people have been hearing the, the new analogy, pets versus, um, it's cats versus cattle or pets versus pigs? That's the other, depends on whether you like consonants, soft or hard consonants, I guess. Um, how many people did I, oh, wow, okay. Wow, this is awesome, because you're going to hear this analogy so much, and you're going to hear it from me first. 
Um, but I'm not going to make you sing again. So uh, in cloud and in uh, DevOps and hyperscale deployments, the goal is to make it where individual nodes, individual machines are completely disposable. And you'll see why this matters in an upgrade scenario. But um, because there's an element of destructiveness here, right? Nobody cries. Actually, a lot of people celebrate when the pig dies. Uh, if you like bacon, I do. Uh, or when a, when a cow dies, right? That's, that's, that's part of their life cycle. They're, they're, they're cattle, right? They're not pets. If it's a cat, right, or a pet, you're much more attached to it. And so the analogy goes that people have got, you know, when they build up a deployment, if your server and your infrastructure is carefully nurtured and just right and it's handcrafted to work, you're not going to touch that, right? You can't repeat it. It's one of a kind, unique thing, okay? The goal here is that all of your deployments, right, are, are cattle. Because what you want to be able to do is say, hey, this, this node, I'm done with it. I can just shut it down and move on, right? So in a case like that, you, know, you could actually say, I'm going to drain this node. I'm going to reformat the hard disks. I'm going to reflash the BIOS. I'm going to bring the thing back up in a new state. And that actually, if you've, if you've got a safe drain procedure, is, is not bad, right? I know I'm, using, I'm, uh, you're, you're, I'm confusing you by using the same example in two different ways. But what, what we're trying to do is it's about safety. And it's about having development DevOps scripts that reset up that machine, right? So I know that the infrastructures that we've been building for OpenStack, uh, for, do, for Hadoop and other applications, right? Any, anything deployed using automation in the cloud, you just say, I need a new one of those. You, it, it builds it, you, you attach it to your infrastructure, it puts load on it, and then you can shoot the old version. No harm in it, right? It's a very different world if you've handcrafted that install and you've connected it to everything and it would take you a day to recreate it. If that's your, if that's your deployment, stop. You will not be able to upgrade that deployment, okay? And it takes some upfront investment to get into the cattle mentality, but this is, this is the benefit, right? The benefit here is profit because OpenStack is not going to reduce complexity. We're going to have more projects. I promise you. I know. We're going to have more projects getting incubated, right? Those projects are going to have more code, right? They're going to do more things. They're going to have features that you want to adopt. You, you don't want to be in a situation where change is hard, right? You want to be in a situation where you can upgrade, you can take a small step, where those, those changes are working. And one of the things that we want to be able to do is we want to be able to say, to do that is we have to be able to say, you've got, you can change it in bits and pieces and phases. Because as our complexity grows, our interdependencies also grow. And we have to be able to isolate you from interdependencies. And I'm going to keep coming back. The only way that's going to happen is if operators are testing release against release. right? And my team's working to take that on. We're working to take on upgrade. It's, they're linked problems but it's not something that just one person does or one team or one company does. It's something that we all have to say, hey, I, this is worthwhile for me to do it, right? It's, and make, make sure that we're going down this. And so what happens is, this isn't something where you just jump into it and make it happen. We actually have to work in cycles for it, right? So you're gonna see some progress, and this is, I'm a very impatient person. Um, this, is, this is something where, you, you have to fight a fire over here, right? You have to get test working. You have to get deployment scripts working. You have to get open operations working. You have to get interoperability. You have to get reference architectures. Because any one of those things can break this cycle, right? If I, if I can't compare my deployment to somebody else's deployment with a reference architecture, then it's almost impossible for me to share my deployment scripts because they're, they're deploying against different infrastructure. Right? If I can't then test that this upgrade worked, then even though we have two people who are doing this, I, the level of effort to test all these interdependencies manually is too high. And I'm going to fall back to what my team already does, which is manual test or release, put it through all its paces, and make sure it all works together. You must have a degree of automated testing in order to get to that next, that next level. So. These are the things, and I've been talking through these uh, all along. 
that we, we, have to be, we have to be driving the community to do. We have to be uh, asking for investment on. And if, if you're doing, and you have developers who want to try and contribute to OpenStack, this type of work is really helpful. It's not glamorous, but it's really helpful. So uh, we must make sure servers and agents, um, and, and I use those terms loosely. Please don't get confused by them. Um, it's, it, I tried, and if people have other suggestions, I'm happy to hear them. Uh, you know, the, the different components of OpenStack interoperate, and at some point you have a server and a client, or a server and an agent. You have two sides of a protocol and an API, and we have to be making those version tolerant, which is the n minus one, right? Testing is important. We have to ensure non-destructive migration, okay? Um, which means that I can take this component and upgrade it. Uh, in some cases, it's fine for it to be a cattle approach to upgrade. I, that that non-destructive to me, it's it's okay as long as you can repeat what you've done. You, but you can't lose data. And the reason why I, I sound so wishy-washy or two-sided on this is it's okay to to take a server, wipe it, and rebuild it. That's cattle. Right, but it's not okay to have operators feel like that's risky, and that's the that's the the two-sided component. I'm seeing some nods in the room, which is helpful. So, right, it, we we can't. It, none of you are going to use DevOps if it keeps destroying your infrastructure. It it has to be safe, right? To be safe, it has to be tested. To be tested, it has to, and now we're back in that loop. Um, Okay, so what, what we're saying here, I hate reading slides, sorry, uh, is that um, you know, we're, we're back to building these expectations. I've been harping on that point. Um, and, but one of the things that, that we have to keep adding, we have to keep doing, is we have to make sure that we don't just test the system as it is on its current version, but that we start introducing some, some differentiated testing back one version, right? And so there's a, one of the things that you'll, you'll see and OpenStack's been making great progress on is testing that we can upgrade the system from point A to point B, right? And I, I was comparing notes with some people. And even with the testing that we're doing on, on point to point upgrade as a system, we're still missing um, interoperable multi-system deployments, okay? So while on a dev stack single system, we might find and we do find and it's, I don't want to denigrate that, we need that, right? That's the first bar. But we have to come back and actually test a multi-system deployment because if somebody breaks multi-system deployment, there's all you know, people in this room are going to be impacted, right? And you're going to be scrambling to figure out how things broke, and now we're back to destructive changes, right? Any time we break operations, it's going to be a destructive change. Okay, um, and I'll go back and repeat: this is we must be able to find and, and upgrade legacy clients. The challenge here is we, we can do that. It's an, it's an exponential problem if you start throwing in old and older and older versions. So if somebody says, hey, I want to upgrade Essex, right? I, I, I'm not sure I should even say that's a good idea at this point. Because we, we don't have a strategy. Actually, let me reframe that. I, don't, I, don't, I, I do want to be able to upgrade. I want to be able to upgrade from every version. But if we're at Fulsome, and the new version is Grizzly, and you're on Essex asking to go from Essex directly to Grizzly, uh, I, I, I've, I'm not sure that that's a reasonable expectation for the community because it's so hard. I've been, I mean, I've been in IT for a long time, and it's, upgrade's always been a challenge, right? Unfortunately, it's also always been the caboose, and we have to stop making it the caboose, right? If we're gonna be successful, and, and I'll tell you, I know what it takes to be successful because I've talked to these cloud operators, if we're going to be successful, we got to get out of putting upgrade and test in big steps at the end of a release. It's got to be done up front. Uh, good. Now I get to pause for questions. Um, one of the things I, I would say is, you know, my team and, and I'm excited to see how many other upstream uh, deployment and we've we've got some upstream talks coming later. Upstreaming means that. Uh, <laughs> There's a really exciting thing going on, and hopefully everybody here will help us with this because community demand makes it easier. There are a significant number of open-sourced deployment infrastructures available. My team uh, has been running Crowbar completely in the open for a long time, um, and 
There have been, you know, Rackspace has, has a set of cookbooks based on Chef. Um, Mirantis has some. AT&T, which isn't even in the player business, has a really great reference set of, of cookbooks. Uh, Microsoft's been working on some through their Hyper-V deployment. Uh, for Puppet, uh, Juju has a whole bunch of pieces out there. We have an amazing wealth of open source deployment capabilities, right? It's actually getting a little overwhelming, and it's probably three other ones, hopefully, on the Twitter stream that, it, that people can, can add. Our challenge here, right, our, our challenge as a, as a community is to get those deployment systems to go up, upstream, meaning OpenStack should have a set of chef cookbooks and puppet cookbooks and Juju modules or charms, Juju charms, um, that should be in the community and ultimately have technical stewardship, and then those tools can use them. And the ra reason is because we want to make sure that they're part of the overall development process. That the, the Crowbar team's actually driving towards that. It might sound a little funny that we're, ta we're taking something that's really close to what we do, but it's, it's what makes things work. It's open operations, it's reference architectures, it's things like that. So what we're, we're really trying to do and we need encouragement for is getting those, those cookbooks, those deployment scripts into the open source community as a shared resource. And then we're, you know, we'll work on those together. Right? So everybody benefits from how things go. Um, and please play along with that. I would love for you to be part of the Crowbar community because that's, that's my community. Uh, but any one of these communities, we're all working towards convergence. So any community you're a part of, anything that works for how you're going is going to help us all get to a continuous deployment, a more operable and upgradable OpenStack, which is really the key. Okay. All right, now that's the end. I'll pause, I've, I've, I've talked fast enough. You guys sang well enough that uh, I, can, I can have questions. Awesome. Uh, so the question is, is there a benevolent dictator on the ops side to force the developers to do this? Um, n not as much. Monty Taylor, who runs the Garrett infrastructure, is probably the closest. And he and I actually were doing a session tomorrow about heat and using heat as a reference architecture template. Uh, so so he's, he's doing that. My team's going to start stepping up. Um, in that, we've been, we've been making some investments so that we can actually start doing tests on that. The, the, the biggest challenge is, is that we're testing a release of OpenStack right at the commit level. We're not testing the upgrade process. Um, and so that takes infrastructure farms and things like that. It's, it's one of my objectives to be standing up at the next summit without repeating these slides. And so... Uh, yeah, that's, we, need, we, need, we need people doing that. And it's, it's operators as much as everybody else. Oh, and there is a OpenStack operators uh, mailing list. Uh, I strongly suggest you subscribe to it. It's very quiet. And so this is a good place where that should surface. Other questions, Jeff? Right. Right. And you look in temp requires, and you look in you know test requires, and you cringe at every equals equals you see. Yeah. Where's the governance to say don't put equals equals? Put equals are greater than unless you found a reason you have to have equals equals. Because what happens is you can then deploy the next version of Glance client that updates your libraries that Nova client was depending on, and now Nova client won't even run. So you can't have simultaneous. Right. You know. Um, so. 
So the question is, how do we deal with the fact that developers sometimes create more restrict, restrictive requirements and just the, the lack of package management in Python? Yes. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll encourage, I, I usually try not to do the self-promotion, but we've, we actually have cookbooks that you can look at about this. So uh, in Folsom, we introduced something called Pull From Source, um, which pulls in all the Python, and we had that problem in spades. And it's actually come a long way, and it's, it's, it was, it's part of our Grizzly, it was part of our Grizzly development, we switched to packages for our, our release. But you can go through the code, and what happens is that we actually have, we deploy a Git repository, cloned Git repository of the code, and then the, all the systems deploy from that, um, which is, and I'm cra people tell me I'm crazy, um, and you guys all have evidence now that I am because of the video. Um, but uh, what I really see is that the, the customers of ours and the operators of ours who are, who are, are really investing in OpenStack understand that they're going to be ahead of, they're going to deploy ahead of trunk, which and uh, it, that sounds crazy. How can you be ahead of trunk? It's easy. If I am an operator of OpenStack and I've deployed the latest milestone and I find a bug and fix that bug, I have to get it through the Garrett review process and all the things. I'm going to put that bug in production. I'm going to put the fix in production whether it's in source or not. So I'm ahead, right? Or I'm working on a feature or a change or something like that. Developers and operators in OpenStack, if we build the infrastructure and address your problem, um, will deploy ahead of trunk, right? Because it allows them to get the fixes and features and changes that they need if we make it possible. Our solution has been that it's part of the deployment infrastructure, and so we find out really fast if there's a breaking change. Um, but it's hell. It was hell when we just did it with packages, um, because one package changes and all of a sudden the whole build infrastructure breaks. And so we have an almost daily, not daily, thank goodness, um, but we have a, a very regular cadence of this package dependency changed and the whole thing broke. And this is why automated and continuous testing is everything. Um, and so, you know, our, our environment, we actually are very uh, aggressive on this. We actually test, automated, do an automated test and deploy of every pull request for our infrastructure, which includes the OpenStack cookbooks, Tempest, uh, Tempest Run, and things like that. So Tempest, if you haven't seen it, you should be using it. It is the automated deployment test for Nova. Uh, it doesn't test upgrades, it's testing that Nova is installed correctly, but what you can do, and what we, what we have invested infrastructure in doing, is we actually, before we accept a deployment change into our environment, we actually will run it through all the suites, have the automated system say, hey, that works, and deploys ac across multiple nodes, and passes Tempest, I think it's okay. It saves us a lot of time. It's a big investment. Last question. It's, it's the question is, do I recommend that people do that? Yeah. Um, no and yes. <laughs> I'm going to have my cake and eat it too. So there's, I, I, I often talk about customers with a lowercase c and customers with a capital C. Okay? And I, I, don't, I don't like to, uh, when people talk about customers with the capital C, it, it's very confusing. I, customers and uh, Chef, um, Jesse Robbins is really good about saying this. Is Jesse? Um, every, every deployment's like a snowflake. Every customer is like a snowflake. They're, they're all different, right? They have different risk tolerances, they have different objectives, they have different goals. Cu so customers with a small C that, that want that investment and want that operations capability, we're making it much safer and easier for them to do that so they can focus on the code and the fixes and, and operating. We have a significant body of customers who were very happy to pick up packages, right? Who want it to be much more stable and secured and tested and all those things. Those are great customers because they, they, they are ones that pay money for OpenStack. The other ones don't, right? And they help us with deployments and making, and, and if, if you're in either camp, it's great. We love both sides of it. The, the ones who want pull from source are the ones who are gonna be collaborating with us and doing pull requests on our, on our deployment scripts and, and driving all these great behaviors and they're the ones who are gonna stub their toes when the ver Python versions are wrong. We love to work with that, okay? On the other side, we have customers who don't wanna go through that pain. They don't, they don't have to. <laughs> so, yes, 
And, and we, don't, we don't force you to choose. There's a flag you can flip between one and another. And the cool thing is you get the deployment scripts. The same deployment scripts should work either way. So we're testing and building deployment scripts against the raw code that's changing like crazy in GitHub. And then at the end of the release, like last week, flip the, flip the flag and start deploying the packages off of the major distros. So you, you can do both. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of, of having the flexibility to do both. And with that, I'm going to get kicked out of this room. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for singing. Thanks.